and Josh Schneider. Welcome to the First Time Gardener. Well, I know since you've been with us the last few shows, a lot of you have probably gone out and created your own gardens. And now you're asking yourself, what do I do next? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You feed your garden. Now, that may sound like a lot of work, but remember, you're your garden's support system. I think, really, working and maintaining your garden is one of the most satisfying aspects of gardening. It sort of gets you into the garden and gets you out of your world. So come with me and we're going to talk about some of the steps to feeding. Water, fertilizer, and soil, the three keys to a healthy, sustainable, and successful garden. And so we're going to talk about fertilizers right now and watering. And this really isn't that hard. Um, one of the things I think that's important, a little trick that I learned in the trade, is about the double splash when you water. So when you water a plant, and let's go back here and water this one. When you water a plant, you want to turn on the hose, you want to water it once, let some water run in there, and then wait till it drips out, pull it off and let it soak in, and then you're going to water it again. And what that allows the water to do is it allows some of the first batch to soak down through the soil, because when you water, you want the whole soil ball to get wet. You just don't want to wet the top. You got to have penetration all the way down on the water so the roots are healthy and stay healthy. And that's why the second watering will help because it pushes that first batch of water on through. We call it the wetting front. It's like a row of soldiers marching through the field. It works its way down and so that's the key, thorough watering. It's better to water thoroughly than to water regularly because just splashing water on the plant won't keep it alive. Is what happens is the roots in the lower end of the plant die in the bottom of the soil because they can't get any water and then the roots on the top are fine but it kills all those down at the bottom and then it starts to rot the roots of the plant. So watering twice, that double splash on any containers or even trees and shrubs in the garden will help the water thoroughly penetrate the soil and affect the roots in the positive way. Now fertilizer is another thing and people get a little scared about fertilizer but there's no reason to be fearful. What you're looking for in a fertilizer is a balanced fertilizer. Now, fertilization is important, especially in containers, because potting soils that are good generally don't hold a lot of nutrients there. And so you want to fertilize regularly all of your containers. I'm telling you, fertilization is the key to fabulous container gardens. All these containers you see around me get fed once a week. And so you can use something like this, which is easy, and it's just a, like a tablespoon per gallon of water in a watering can and, and glug, 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 and you fed them. You can use a time-release fertilizer, which I like as well, and this is a good insurance policy. I still personally use the blue stuff, and then I also use time-release. What happens is every time you water, the little balls release a little bit of fertilizer into the soil, so it's sort of time-release. I'm not a big fan of the stakes that you stick in because I don't think those work well enough. They don't distribute the nutrients around. But you can take this little scoop and always read the label instructions on the plant. But remember that especially container gardens with annuals or flowering plants in them, those need to be fed more regularly because they're considered, I would talk about these like they're the triathletes of the plant kingdom, these vining petunias. They need lots of fertilizer to stay healthy and green. And in fact, you can see on this plant, it doesn't look too hot. But this one is really nice. And the difference is this one hasn't been getting fertilized on a regular basis. So it's what happens is when you look at the leaves, they've got intervenial chlorosis, which in English means it's yellowing. What's happening is the plant is actually metabolizing the chlorophyll in the leaves to feed itself because it's so hungry. Yellow leaves are generally a sign of nitrogen deficiency. Now nitrogen is the first number in the fertilizer. This one is 20, 30, 20. First number is nitrogen, the second number is phosphorus, and then potassium is the third number, NPK. Now what that translates to in English is leaf is the first number, flower is the second number, and root is the third number. So that's why we want to balance. We want a fairly balanced fertilizer. Now a 20, 30, 20 is okay. A 15, 30, 15 is also good. That's just fine. Now the other thing you need to remember is good soil. So we've talked about watering, we've talked about fertilizer, you've got to remember your soil. And here we've got some mushroom compost. Remember that soil amendments are important. The organic matter that soil amendments like mushroom compost or steer manure or chicken manure, that organic material is the glue that holds your soil together. It provides the, the gunk that is the 
nutrients for the plants. So you always want to mix in a fair amount, maybe in a container garden, maybe one quarter you could mix potting soil with mushroom compost. But in the ground, always top dress, whether it's the amendments that I've mentioned, or whether it's composted bark fines, or composted leaves, or grass clippings, all those things will add organic matter to the soil. And the organic matter is the glue that holds all those mineral bits together. It's part of a good, balanced soil that will be fertile and grow beautiful plants in it. One of the things I love about gardening is that I get to play with a lot of great tools. Now, tools have to be useful and not just take up space in the garden shed. Now, gardening clogs or shoes may not seem like a tool, but they're great because they slip on and off easily, and they're rubber, so they won't get all wet and soggy. They're great for getting around and mucking in the soil. The rain wand is the ultimate in watering wands. It waters your plants just the way they like it, at the right speed, it's easy to use, and it'll last a long time. These European cutters are fantastic pruners. They're not the cheap, junky ones that break in half the first time you use them on a branch bigger than your little finger. They're pruners that will last for generations. In fact, my grandmother gave me hers that she had had for years. They're made in Switzerland, and they just are workhorses. Now, quality tools are never cheap, but it pays to buy quality because they're going to last. For more information on any of the subjects we've covered in today's show, go to our website at DIYNet.com. Get ready to learn all about roses, pruning, good bugs, and drip irrigation. All when we come back to the First Time Gardener. DIY Roses are a classical flower and a symbol of love, and there are a bunch of different kinds of roses. Hybrid teas are probably the most popular type of rose, and that's the kind of rose you'd find in a florist shop. Now, Hybrid tea roses require a lot more care than many people think. And so the other kinds of roses I think are better for people to stick closer to are shrub roses. And they encompass several different classes of roses, but they're basically a bush rose that blooms all the time. They're easy to grow and disease resistant. Just remember your roses like a lot of water and fertilizer. If you take really good care of them, they'll perform well for you. I'm here today with John Rader from Proven Winners. He has a master's degree from BYU in horticulture, and he's going to help us do some pruning today and talk to us about the importance of pruning your plants. Thanks for joining us, John. You're welcome, Josh. So pruning is something you know that people are scared of. They don't know what to cut, and when they do cut, they tend to sort of just you know nip around the edges. And so this is a, a shrub called Wygela Midnight Wine, and it's a bit rangy as it's going into dormancy. What do you think would be the best way to make this? A little better and improve its shape next spring. But, well, I think that there's some uh, universal pruning things that I, I try to use when I'm pruning or cutting back a plant. And um, the uh, first thing that I look at is I try to picture what I want the plant to look like when it starts to grow out again. Of course, I don't want it to be scraggly to where these buds would come out and be up here like this. I mm -hmm. want it to start out to where it comes from a nice symmetrical form here at the bottom. So the way that I do that is I try to identify strategic buds along the stems of the plants that I can cut back to because then those buds will come out at the right height to be able to give me the kind of growth that I want to uh, make this plant look good. So um, for example on this large stem here I like this, this bud, these two buds here. They're, they're nice and waxy. They're very much alive. You can feel that they're full. And so I'll cut back. I'll leave maybe about a half an inch above them because there may be some dieback. And if there's some dieback, I don't want the dieback to take out the buds also. Is it generally better to do a lot of pruning at once, like once every few years, or is it better to, to prune on a regular basis and maintain the shape that way? Oh, definitely regular pruning okay. on some sort of a schedule is the best, because if you do allow a plant to get overgrown and it doesn't have a lot of young buds and growth down inside to pull from, then what comes out will be very unsightly. If you can just do a little bit of gradual pruning, sort of like disciplining your children, right. then, um, then it, it works out better rather than having a major blow up and, right. and causing a lot of rebellion and resentment. Okay, well that's good to know, that's great. Well let's go on to these guys. These are some interesting plants that came off the sale rack at the garden center and they're a little bit ugly. And I just thought we could give some of these a haircut and make up a nice container garden, give people an idea about how it's okay to cut back flowering plants as well. So this is a Symphony Osteospermum. It's a great plant that I really like with a gorgeous yellow color, but we've just taken off about half the plant and half the flowers. And uh, so that's a good one. And that's... Angel Face Blue. 
this has got a, uh, a break in the stem and uh, so this is going to have to be corrected because that will always be a weakness on that plant. Mm -hmm. So what I would recommend doing on this one because of that break and its uh, susceptibility to disease is I would just go ahead and cut below that. I can see that I've got another sure. stem coming out the bottom and another one below that to take its place. So I would go ahead and just cut both of those off okay. like that. And you see you've got a nice clean cut there that will heal up just fine. And then you've got these, uh, these other stems here. Now as we are more interested, I think, in some of the growth that's going to be coming in the future, um, then we're going to want to go ahead and cut this back so that some of these younger buds emerge from the bottom and fill in this gap and make a nicer plant in the end. So I would be cutting it right about here. So this is a little delayed gratification. People get kind of anxious about cutting off the flowers, but you always have to know that when you prune something back like this, it's going to send out a lot more shoots and you'll end up with more flowers after the pruning than you had before. Particularly with one of these uh, soft vegetative type plants, it's, 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 uh, they grow very fast, so they'll okay. quickly renew themselves. All right, well let's stick that in here and see what else we've got. How about that red petunia? It's, uh, it's looking a little rangy, and these are super tunias. Um, and super tunias are great because they're like the teenage boys of the plant world. They grow really, really fast. So you think we could do some serious hacking on this and it'd probably be okay? Definitely. Th these kind of petunias are, have a lot of wild uh, blood in them, so to speak, like you said. So they do grow extremely fast. So they will bounce back from a heavy cutback very quickly. In fact, I have seen where they've been cut back to just a stem in the dirt and it came back from that. Wow. So, so you, you can't go wrong or make too many mistakes pruning one of these. Oh, well, that's good to know. Well, let's hack off some of these stragglers. The idea is we want to give it a little better shape and so there's no, like, hanging over bits. So I think, John, you've given us lots of great advice. If people want more information on pruning, you should go to our website at www.diynet.com and there will be a lot of good information there. John, thank you so much for all your help. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Coming up next, there's a war going on in your garden, and it's fought with bugs. And we'll show you how to turn these pipes into a great drip irrigation system. When we return to the... There's a war going on. It's taking place in your garden. In fact, in your garden, in a one square yard area, there's over a thousand bugs present. And you know, not all insects are bad. The good bugs are battling the bad bugs for control of your garden. Now, what can we do to help the good bugs win? because we're all in favor of the good bugs winning. Well, I'll tell you what, you can actually buy beneficial insects and do things that promote the growth and flourishing of beneficial insects in your garden. The idea of using beneficial insects is that we don't quite use as much pesticides as we normally would, and using less pesticide is always a good thing. So there are a couple different kinds of beneficial insects that you can take a look at buying and adding to your garden. This is a nematode that goes into the soil. And in fact, this nematode kills the larva or the young babies of cucumber beetles, cinch bugs, Japanese beetles, all sorts of different beetles. The easy way to apply them is to mix them with water and you can spray them on in the early morning or late evening. You don't want the direct sunlight on them too much because it can kill them. And you want to make sure you water them in. The idea is to get these nematodes down in the soil. And the best way to get them there is to sprinkle them on in a hose and sprayer, water them on, and then water them down into the soil with clear water. And then we have parasitic wasps called Incarcia. And they're a microscopic wasp. Actually, they're very tiny. And you buy them on these cards. And so you hang them over the branch, and they go out and they lay eggs in the eggs of the enemy animal. So they'll lay eggs in the eggs of white flies. It's a lot of eggs, but it's worth doing. And they're convenient because you just hang this little piece of paper on the branch, and they hatch and go about their business. Now, next we have probably the best loved and most well-respected beneficial insect, ladybugs. These ladybugs will reproduce in the areas of your garden where they find attractive, where there's water and the soil is moist. They'll lay eggs and reproduce, and their babies actually prey on aphids and other undesirable insects. They're very good predators against the bad insects. Up next, I'm going to show you how to create a drip irrigation system that'll simplify your watering chores. 
Verbenas are fantastic plants that have really been reinvented in the last five or six years. The old varieties used to basically croak 10 minutes after you planted them. But these new hybrid varieties, crosses between native North American and South American types, are so much more disease resistant, they have tons more flowers, and they bloom for such a long period of time. They're great in containers and in the landscape. Cool new plants. There are a couple different options when you're watering your garden, and as we know, all the flowers like some water occasionally. The first one involves a costume and a rain dance, and that may not be terribly practical for everyday watering, plus it might worry the neighbors a bit. The second is overhead watering, and that's one of the easiest ways, but one of the downsides to overhead watering is that it sort of can sometimes break up the plants and give them a little bit of a bad hair day. I think one of the easiest ways to water is a drip irrigation kit. We went to our home improvement center, picked up a drip irrigation kit. It's $25 or $30. It's great, and it saves a lot of headache and heartache later. So we're going to put one of these together. Now, we've taken it and cut a piece. We've put the screw on the hose end thinger there. You just twist this on. It's really pretty simple. And then all the water will run through it, and it won't do anything unless we crimp the end. And we take the little figure eight and slide it over the end, and then we can crimp it and it stops the water from escaping, except through the emitters, which is the whole point of this operation. So we're gonna lay this out here around, we have a little table here, a little platform of, of plants, and rather than overhead watering them every day, we can set them up so they'll be pretty easy to use on a drip irrigation system. We take our hole punch, which is a real neat little tool, and you just push down on it and twist at the same time, and you'll feel it snap through. We're gonna make one hole here and one hole here. And hey, what the heck, let's make another hole back here. This thing's lots of fun. If you have any bit left over, you can just make lots of holes. It's like popping bubble wrap. Then we're going to take some of the mini tubing. Then you put this in the hole. Here we go. We're going to take it, and if you squeeze the sides as you're pushing it in, it goes in a little easier. You'll hear the snap. Now, here's another one. We're just going to pop this one in. Now, drip irrigation is, comes in a couple different incarnations. There's also soaker hoses, and those are great, but the whole thing drips. On these, the water only comes out of the ends. Then we want to take some emitters. Now, this is the red one, and the red one drips at a slower rate, and we're going to put that on here. We're going to twist it on, and now we've got an end on it. And then the green one drips at about twice the rate of the red one. So we're going to twist this one on, get it red slower, green faster. We can pop these in. And the nice thing about this is it'll weight it a little bit. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to lay this, sort of wiggle it down in to the pot and get it tangled up a little bit. That'll hold it in there. And we're going to wiggle this one in. You can bring them up from the back. And you want to get them towards the center of the pot because that'll help distribute the water evenly. Now the great thing about drip irrigation is that the water comes out slowly and it'll saturate the pot. It's better to have the pot saturated than just spray the water on it where it all runs around the edges. That's not actually watering the plant. You want to make sure that the whole root ball gets saturated. And that's the genius of drip irrigation is it comes out slowly so it actually conserves water. It'll be really easy and your plants will thank you for it. They'll be beautiful and glorious all summer long. Before you go, I've got one more tip for you. It's how to keep those nasty weeds out of your garden. And it's so easy you won't believe it. Take some old newspaper, wet it down, and spread it over the ground in your garden. You can overlap it and then spread mulch over the top of it. This will provide an, an impenetrable barrier to weeds, and it can last up to a year. I'm Josh Schneider. I'll see you next time.